Thank you. The chair recognizes uh, the gentleman from Rhode Island. Thank you, uh, Director Ray, for your service to our country, and thank you to the men and women of the FBI. Uh, gun violence is an epidemic in our country. Uh, in my home state of Rhode Island last month, a 31-year-old man was shot at a park while playing with his son. A teenage woman was killed while sitting in a car. A 20-year-old man was shot to death outside of his home. And the same thing is happening in cities all across America. And there's no question that this problem has gotten worse during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in 2020, Rhode Island saw a significant increase in gun sales. And during that same time, we saw an 87% increase in gun-related deaths. And that trend has continued into 2021. And so uh, I hope that uh, you can shed some light on what the FBI can do and how Congress can support the agency to fight uh, an epidemic that will claim 40,000 American lives this year. And so specifically, as I discussed, gun rails skyrocketed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Nearly 23 million firearms were purchased nationwide in 2020, a 64% increase. And for each of these sales, a background check is required, putting tremendous pressure on our background check system. And in fact, in March of last year, the start of the pandemic, federal background checks hit a 1 million in a week uh, mark. And so what does that increase in gun sales mean for the background check system and for public safety, and particularly uh, with respect to your ability to complete a background check within three days as required by the statute? So, Congressman, I appreciate the question for, uh, for a number of reasons, not the least of which is our folks at NICS, the background check systems, uh, have worked incredibly hard this past year in particular, right through the teeth of the pandemic, and had to be very creative in terms of how we kept people socially distanced, rotating shifts, et cetera. We lived in fear that we would suddenly lose the ability to be able to continue to process the checks because we could potentially wipe out, in terms of having to quarantine, an entire room full of cubicles of people. Um, we we processed additional, last year 40. Be, yeah, my, my question, I guess, is would additional resources be helpful in order to keep up with this pace so that we don't have the three-day period passing before the background check can be completed? Absolutely. We, we have been had to, having to do overtime. We've been having to pull people from other key missions to staff it. We did, I am very proud of the fact that even though we did a record, a record, you used 23 million, uh, my information is that we processed 40 million firearms background checks last year, last year, and then we were able to complete about 96% of those within the three days, despite that record, despite the pandemic. Thank you, Director. So in 2018, the Center for American Progress, and according to FBI data as well, almost 4,000 prohibited purchasers were able to get a gun because the background check for their sale was not completed within three days. This is the loophole that allowed the Charleston shooter, who legally should have never been allowed to purchase a firearm, to buy a gun and use it to murder nine worshipers in the church. So my question is, how is the FBI supporting the ATF's recovery of firearms found to be transferred to a prohibited purchaser? Are you giving specific instructions nationwide to FT office, ATF offices on how to do this? Uh, are those practices being formalized? Because my experience is they're supposed to be recovered by ATF, but it doesn't seem like that happens. This is individuals who got a gun from a gun store who are legally prohibited from owning it. And I've actually introduced the bill, the unlawful gun buyer alert, that would require local law enforcement be notified if firearms are delivered to a prohibited purchaser and wonder whether you think that would also be helpful in making jurisdictions uh, aware when someone has illegally purchased a gun. But I'm really interested to know what you're doing with your field offices at ATF and this recovery and how we can at least take on this issue of people getting guns from a gun store who don't pass a background check. I think it might be better for me to offer to have my staff provide you more information about the details of how we work with ATF. They have a very, very tough job, as you alluded to, in recovering the guns that uh, are, are sold to people who are prohibited by law from having them. Can a briefing on that, Director, because I'm very, that'd be very helpful to us. We'd be, to, be happy to set up a briefing on that subject. And my last question, Director, is uh, since September 11th, uh, the FBI has provided tens of millions of dollars of counterterrorism training and resources to state and local uh, law enforcement agencies. How is the FBI reallocating this support to state and local partners to address the rise of white supremacists and anti-government groups? And is the Bureau also giving guidance to the Joint Terrorism Task Force 
to address white supremacist extremism. So a couple of things there. One is we absolutely are providing domestic terrorism training um, to state and local partners. And we've actually recently been providing some of our more advanced training to the state and local officers of whom there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds who are task force officers on our joint terrorism task forces. As to the prioritization of the joint terrorism task forces on domestic terrorism and specifically racially motivated violent extremism, when I elevated that to a, our highest priority level uh, back in summer of 2019, the effect of that was to make sure that not only that all 56 field officers are collecting intelligence and disseminating it on that subject, but also to make sure that all 200 plus joint terrorism task forces and the 4,500 or 5,000, whatever it is, uh, investigators that are on them have domestic terrorism and specifically that part of domestic terrorism squarely within their sites. And you, you the, the, the gentleman is, the gentleman's time, the gentleman, the gentleman's time is expired. Christopher Ray was flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm you know, a huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is, because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney, or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases, and this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category, and they are treating them uh, like unlike I've ever seen in a case, uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm -hmm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C. There is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. He made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically, as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. There was no white supremacy uh, massive 
uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media. When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who... Um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other Capitol she's ever been in is a state Capitol that's open 24 seven. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between, you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they want to prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is. It's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.